The stolen letter was written in 1854. This BBC Radio production is read by Gerard Green and was first broadcast in 1989. I served my time, never mind in whose office, and I started in business for myself in one of our English country towns. I hadn't a farthing of capital, and my friends in the neighbourhood were poor and useless enough, with one exception. That exception was Mr Frank Gatliff, son of Mr Gatliff, member for the county, the richest man and the proudest for many a mile round about our parts. You won't trace any particulars by the name of Gatliff. I have given you the first that came into my head. Well, Mr. Frank was a staunch friend of mine, and ready to recommend me whenever he got the chance. He came back from college and stopped at home a little while, and then there got spread about all our neighbourhood a report that he had fallen in love, as the saying is, with his young sister's governess, and that his mind was made up to marry her. Uh, speaking as a lawyer, I consider a report, in a general way, to be a fool and a liar. But in this case report turned out to be something very different. Mr. Frank told me he was really in love and said he was determined to marry the sweet darling girl, as he called her. Well, Mr. Frank's father, being as proud as Lucifer, said no as to marrying the governess. He was a man of business, was old Gatliff, and he took the proper business course. He sent the governess away with a first-rate character and a spanking present, and then looked about him to get something for Mr. Frank to do. While he was looking about, Mr. Frank bolted to London after the governess, who had nobody alive belonging to her to go to but an aunt, and writes to his father saying he will marry the girl as soon as he is of age or shoot himself. Up to town comes the squire and his wife and his daughter. The upshot of it is that old Gatliff is forced into withdrawing the word no and substituting the word yes. I don't believe he would ever have done it, though, but for one lucky peculiarity in the case. The governess's father had been a man of good family, pretty nigh as good as Gatliff's own. The time was fixed for the wedding, and an announcement about it put into the county paper. There was a regular biography, besides, of the governess's father, so as to stop people from talking, a great flourish about his pedigree and a long account of his services in the army but not a word of his having turned wine merchant afterwards. Oh, no, not a word about that. I knew it, though, for Mr. Frank told me. He hadn't a bit of pride about him. He introduced me to his future wife one day when I met him out walking and asked me if I did not think he was a lucky fellow. I don't mind admitting that I did and that I told him so. Ah, uh, but she was one of my sort, was that governess. The marriage was to take place on a Wednesday. I was sitting alone in my office on the Monday morning before the wedding day when Mr Frank suddenly bursts in as white as any ghost that ever was painted and says he's got the most dreadful case for me to advise on and not an hour to lose in acting on my advice. I gather, says I, that you are in a scrape which is likely to interfere seriously with your marriage. He nodded. The scrape affects your young lady and goes back to the period of a transaction in which her late father was engaged, doesn't it? He nods. Uh, there is a party who turned up after seeing the announcement of your marriage in the paper, who is cognizant of what he oughtn't to know, and who is prepared to use his knowledge of the same to the prejudice of the young lady and of your marriage, unless he receives a sum of money to quiet him? Hmm. Very well. Now, first of all, Mr Frank, State what you have been told by the young lady herself about the transaction of her late father. How did you first come to have any knowledge of it? She was talking to me about her father one day so tenderly and prettily that she quite excited my interest about him, begins Mr Frank. And I asked her, among other things, what had occasioned his death. She said she believed it was distress of mind in the first instance, and that the great mistake of her father's life was his selling out of the army and taking to the wine trade. He had no talent for business. Things went wrong with him from the first. His clerk, it was strongly suspected, cheated him. Uh, stop a bit, says I. What was that suspected clerk's name? Davager, says he. 
Davager. Go on, Mr. Frank. His affairs got more and more entangled. He was pressed for money in all directions. Bankruptcy and consequent dishonour stared him in the face. In this state of desperation and misery, he... Here Mr. Frank began to hesitate. Ah, I know what he did. He had a signature to write, and by the most natural mistake in the world, he wrote another gentleman's name instead of his own. Eh? It was to a bill, says Mr. Frank, looking very crestfallen. And the forgery was discovered. When? Before even the first attempt was made to negotiate the bill. He'd done the whole thing in the most absurdly and innocently wrong way. The person whose name he'd used was a staunch friend of his and a relation of his wife's, a good man as well as a rich one. He put the false bill into the fire, drew a bill of his own to replace it, and then, only then, told my dear girl and her mother all that had happened. Well, can you imagine anything nobler? asks Mr. Frank. Speaking in my professional capacity, I can't imagine anything greener, says I. Where was the father? Off, I suppose. Ill in bed, says Mr. Frank, colouring. But he mustered strength enough to write a contrite and grateful letter the same day, promising to prove himself worthy of the noble moderation and forgiveness extended to him by selling off everything he possessed to repay his money debt. It was too late. He died, I cut in. Yes. Uh, let's go back for a minute to the contrite and grateful letter that he wrote. Do you happen to know whether it contained anything like an avowal or confession of the forgery? Of course it did, says he. Uh, should I be altogether in error if I thought that this letter had been stolen and that the fingers of Mr. Davager might possibly be the fingers which took it? That is exactly what I wanted to make you understand, cried Mr. Frank. He sent me this letter. To Francis Gatliffe Esquire, Jr. Sir, I have an extremely curious autograph letter to sell. The price is a £500 note. The young lady to whom you are to be married on Wednesday will inform you of the nature of the letter and the genuineness of the autograph. If you refuse to deal, I shall send a copy to the local paper and shall wait on your highly respected father with the original curiosity on the afternoon of Tuesday next. Having come down here on family business, I am to be heard of at the Gatliffe Arms. Your very obedient servant, Alfred Davager. Yeah, a clever fellow, that, says I, putting the letter into my private drawer. Will you give Mr. Davager his price for it? Yes, says Mr. Frank, quite peevish with me for asking him such a question. He was an easy young chap in money matters, and talked of hundreds, as most men talk of sixpences. Here is my proposal, says I. I'm going to try if I can't do Mr. Davager out of his letter. If I don't succeed before tomorrow afternoon, you hand him the money, and I charge you nothing for professional services. If I do succeed, I hand you the letter instead of Mr. Davager, and you give me the five hundred pounds instead of giving it to him. What do you say to my plan? Is it yes, Mr. Frank, or no? Hang your questions, cries Mr. Frank, jumping up. You know it's yes, ten thousand times over. I hustled him out of the office for I wanted to be left alone to make up my mind about what I should do. The first thing, of course, was to have a look at the enemy. I wrote to Mr. Davager, telling him that I was privately appointed to arrange the little business matter between himself and another party on friendly terms, and begging him to call on me at his earliest convenience. A spy to look after Mr. Davager was, of course, the first requisite in a case of this kind, and I instructed my boy Tom the quickest, stealthiest little snake that ever dogged a gentleman's steps, to wait outside and to follow Mr. Davager wherever he went till he got back to his inn. About a quarter to seven, my gentleman came. In the profession of the law, we get somehow quite remarkably mixed up with ugly people, blackguard people and dirty people. But far and away, the ugliest and dirtiest blackguard I ever saw in my life was Mr. Alfred Davager. He had 
greasy white hair and a mottled face. He was low in the forehead, fat in the stomach, hoarse in the voice and weak in the legs, and carried a toothpick in his mouth. Before we say a word about the money, I began, let me put a case, Mr. Davager. The pull you have on Mr. Francis Gatliff is that you can hinder his marriage on Wednesday. Now, suppose I have got a magistrate's warrant to apprehend you in my pocket. Suppose I have a constable to execute it in the next room. Suppose... Uh, stop a bit, says Mr. Davager. Suppose I should not be the greenest fool that ever stood in shoes. Suppose I should not carry the letter about me. Suppose I should have given a certain envelope to a certain friend of mine in a certain place in this town. Suppose the letter should be inside that envelope, directed to old Gatliff, side by side with a copy of the letter directed to the editor of the local paper. Suppose my friend should be instructed to open the envelope and take the letters to their right address if I don't appear to claim them from him this evening. In short, my dear sir, Suppose you were born yesterday, and suppose I wasn't, says Mr. Davager, and winks at me. He didn't take me by surprise, for I never expected that he had the letter about him. I made a pretense of being very much taken aback, and of being quite ready to give in. We settled our business about delivering the letter and handing over the money in no time. I was to draw out a document which he was to sign. It served me as an excuse to put off the payment of the £500 till three o'clock on the Tuesday afternoon. The Tuesday morning, Mr. Davager said he should devote to his amusement and asked me what sights were to be seen in the neighbourhood of the town. When I had told him, he pitched his toothpick into my grate, yawned and went out. I rang the bell once, waited till he'd passed the window, and then looked after Tom. There was my jewel of a boy on the opposite side of the street, just setting his top going in the most playful manner possible. Mr. Davager walked away up the street towards the marketplace. Tom whipped his top up the street towards the marketplace too. In a quarter of an hour, he came back with all his evidence collected in a beautifully clear, compact state. Mr. Davager had walked to a public house just outside the town. On a bench outside the public house, there sat a man smoking. He said, all right, and gave a letter to Mr. Davager, who answered, all right, and walked back to the inn. In the hall, he ordered hot rum water, cigars, slippers, and a fire to be lit in his room. After that, he went upstairs, and Tom came away. I now saw my road clear before me. Not very far on, but still clear. He had housed the letter, in all probability for that night, at the Gatliff Arms. After tipping Tom, I gave him directions to play about the door of the inn. If Mr. Davager went out or Mr. Davager's friend called on him, Tom was to let me know. He was also to take a little note from me to the head chambermaid, an old friend of mine, asking her to step over to my office on a private matter of business as soon as her work was done for that night. When the head chambermaid came, it turned out, as good luck would have it, that Mr. Davager had drawn her attention rather too closely to his ugliness by offering her a testimony of his regard in the shape of a kiss. I no sooner mentioned him than she flew into a passion. And when I added, by way of clinching the matter, that I was retained to defend the interests of a very beautiful and deserving lady against the most cruel underhand treachery on the part of Mr. Davager, the head chambermaid was ready to go to any length that she could to serve my cause. In a few words, I discovered that Boots was to call Mr. Davager at eight the next morning and was to take his clothes downstairs to brush as usual. If Mr. D had emptied his pockets overnight, then, of course, it would be necessary to transfer the searching process to Mr. D's room. At half-past seven next morning, I slipped quietly 
into Boots' pantry. Down came the clothes. No pockets in trousers. Waistcoat pockets empty. Coat pockets with something in them. First, handkerchief. Secondly, a bunch of keys. Thirdly, cigar case. Fourthly, pocketbook. Of course, I wasn't such a fool as to expect to find the letter there, but I opened the pocketbook with a certain curiosity notwithstanding. On one leaf by itself, I found this queer inscription. Mem, five along, four across. I understood everything but those words and figures, so, of course, I copied them out into my own book. Then I waited in the pantry till Boots had brushed the clothes and taken them upstairs. His report when he came down was that Mr. D had ordered breakfast at nine and a saddle horse to be at the door at ten to take him to Grimwith Abbey, one of the sites in our neighbourhood which I had told him of the evening before. I'll be here coming in by the back way, at half-past ten, says I to the head chambermaid. What for? says she. To take the responsibility of making Mr. Davager's bed off your hands for this morning only, says I. Any more orders? says she. Would my boy Tom be very much in the way if he came to help with the boots and stood at his work close by this window which looks out on the staircase? There were three things Mr. Davager might do with the letter. He might give it to his friend again before ten, in which case Tom would most likely see the said friend on the stairs. He might take it to his friend, or to some other friend, after ten, in which case Tom was ready to follow him. And lastly, he might leave it hidden in his room at the inn, in which case... I was all ready for him with a search warrant of my own granting, and a favour always of my friend the head chambermaid. Only two things bothered me. The terrible shortness of the time at my disposal, and that queer inscription which I had copied out of the pocket-book. Mem, five along, four across. It was the measurement, most likely, of something and he was afraid of forgetting it. Therefore, it was something important. What do five along and four across mean? The measurement of something he carries about with him, or the measurement of something in his room? I slipped into the inn by the back way a little before half-past ten. The head chambermaid gave me a signal when the landing was clear. I got into his room without a soul but her seeing me, and locked the door immediately. I searched, to begin with, on the usual plan, examining everything in every possible way. No discovery. Then I pulled out a carpenter's rule which I had brought with me. Was there anything in the room which either in inches, feet or yards answered to five along and four across? Nothing. Was there anything in the room that would count up to five one way and four another, seeing that nothing would measure up to it? Not on the paper. The pattern there was pillars of trellis work and flowers enclosing a plain green ground, only four pillars along the wall and only two across. The furniture? There were not five chairs or five separate pieces of any furniture in the room altogether. The fringes? that hung from the cornice of the bed. Plenty of them, at any rate. Up I jumped on the counterpane with my penknife in my hand. Every way that five along and four across could be reckoned on those unlucky fringes, I reckoned on them, probed with my penknife, scratched with my nails, crunched with my fingers. No use. Not a sign of a letter. And the time was getting on. I jumped down from the bed, so desperate at my ill luck that I hardly cared whether anybody heard me or not. Quite a little cloud of dust arose at my feet as they thumped on the carpet. Hello, thought I. 
My friend, the head chambermaid, takes it easy here. Nice state for a carpet to be in, in one of the best bedrooms at the Gatliff Arms. Carpet. I had been jumping up on the bed and staring up at the walls, but I had never so much as given a glance down at the carpet. Think of me pretending to be a lawyer and not knowing how to look low enough. The carpet. The ground was brown, and the pattern was bunches of leaves and roses speckled over the ground at regular distances. I reckoned up the bunches. Ten along the room, eight across it. When I had stepped out five one way and four the other and was down on my knees on the centre bunch, as true as I sit on this chair, I could hear my own heart beating so loud that it quite frightened me. I looked narrowly all over the bunch and I scraped it over slowly and gently with my nails. My second fingernail stuck a little at one place. I parted the pile of the carpet over that place and saw a thin slit which had been hidden by the pile being smoothed over it, a slit about half an inch long with a little end of brown thread sticking out about a quarter of an inch from the middle. I took a little pull at the thread and heard something rustle. I took a longer pull and out came a piece of paper rolled up tight like those candle lighters that the ladies make. I unrolled it and by George there was the letter. The original letter. I knew it by the colour of the ink. The letter that was worth five hundred pounds to me. It was all that I could do to keep myself at first from throwing my hat into the air and hurrahing like mad. I had to take a chair and sit quiet in it for a minute or two before I could cool myself down to my proper business level. I knew that I was safely down again when I found myself pondering how to let Mr. Davager know that he'd been done by the innocent country attorney after all. It was not long before a nice little irritating plan occurred to me. I tore a blank leaf out of my pocketbook, wrote on it with my pencil, change for a five hundred pound note, folded up the paper, tied the thread to it, poked it back into the hiding place, smoothed over the pile of the carpet, and then bolted off to Mr. Frank. He, in his turn, bolted off to show the letter to the young lady, who first certified to its genuineness, then dropped it into the fire, and then took the initiative for the first time since her marriage engagement by flinging her arms round his neck, kissing him with all her might, and going into hysterics in his arms. I saw them married with my own eyes on the Wednesday. And while they went off in a carriage and four to spend the honeymoon, I went off on my own legs to open a credit at the town and county bank with a £500 note in my pocket. As to Mr. Davager, I have been since given to understand that he left the Gatliff Arms that same night with his best clothes on his back and with all the valuable contents of his dressing case in his pockets. I am not in a condition to state whether he ever went through the form of asking for his bill or not but I can positively testify that he never paid it and that the effects left in his bedroom did not pay it either. Stolen Letter by Wilkie Collins was adapted by Michael Bakewell. It was read by Garrard Green and produced by Rosemary Hart.